to so today we're going to discuss um, why the monuments are made out of stone and why they are etched letters that are in the stone. We're also going to discuss one of the oldest Jewish customs of placing a little stone on the monument. Where does that come from? We started speaking a little bit about it last week. But this week we're going to go into greater detail. Uh, to start off with a story of a uh, of the Friedrich Rebbe in the, uh, in the 1940s. He used to send his emissaries to different cities in, in America to try to bring the Jews back. And he sent his emissary to a city called Chicago. I'm sure you all heard of Chicago. And in Chicago, there was a fellow that lived there, a very wealthy man who was there. And he, uh, he had old connections to Chabad, his family, his grandparents were connected to Lubavitch and the city of Lubavitch. And he came to America and he was a modern guy who had nothing to do with the Jewish community. But the Friedrich Rebbe, the Jewish Lubavitch Rebbe, if he came to America, he, he was trying to track, trace all these, these Jewish people to find them. So he sent his emissary to him to visit him in, in, in Chicago and the emissary of the Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef, he comes into the, uh, into the, uh, this wealthy man's office, and he comes inside, and, and uh, the fellow asks the rabbi, how much money would you like, rabbi? The rabbi says, I, I didn't come for money. He says, what'd you come? I said, I came for you. Yeah, rabbi, you came for me. I came, and he says, the rabbi said to him like this. He says, the previous rabbi, the Lubavitch rabbi sent me here, and you know, in the olden days, in the, uh, in the small shtetelach, they didn't have any permanent scribes there. But no scribes there. So the, the, everybody had Torahs. There were lots of Torahs that they used to have. Just give me one second over here. Get something out of there. The sun from coming in over here. Too much sunshine is not so good either, right? You know, <laughs> my face was so my face was so bright. So the rabbi says, in the olden days, <clears throat> they used to have a scribe. <clears throat> in some cities, didn't have a scribe, so they had a, a, a traveling scribe. That was his job. He went from city to city, and he used to go to every city and he'd speak to the rabbi and ask him, "How are your Torahs? Do they need any help?" And so he said, "Rabbi, say, I was on this Torah needs a little." A little, uh, you know, some of the letters are cracking, so the, the scribe would come and fix it. He'd go work on the mezuzot, on the mezuzahs and the tefillin in the city. That was his job. He was the traveling scribe. He would fix all the Torahs, the tefillin and the mezuzahs. And uh, <clears throat> he says to the wealthy man, of Yosef, the, the emissary of the, of the Lubavitch Rebbe says, he says, and that's my job. He says, I'm like a traveling scribe. So I said, he said, every Jew has a little Torah in their heart. And sometimes the Torah gets a little bit old and worn out. And it needs to be a little bit fixed up. It needs to be corrected. The little letter that's maybe a little cracked. He said, my job is, the Rebbe sent me here, that I should fix your, the letters in your soul. That's a symbolic concept, very nice concept. <clears throat> and the guy was very impressed. With this idea, and he was moved by it, touched by it, and about his genuine concern for his Torah in his heart, that his job was to fill it in. And he, he put on he put on the filling with him, and he put up a mezuzah on his door. And he came back to the Rebbe, this Rabbi Yosef, who was the, the emissary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, comes back to the Rebbe and says to the Rebbe, I had a very good time. And the Rebbe says, did you go visit that Jew, that, that Chabad, the guy who was a grandchild of some Chabad Hasidim in Chicago? The Rebbe, he says, yeah, Rebbe. The Rebbe says, what did you tell him? And he told the Rebbe, he says, you're going to like what I said. I said something very, very sharp, very smart. The guy asked me if I came for money. I said, no, I'm not here for money. I'm here to, to, to fix your soul. The Rebbe said, yeah, what did you tell him? He says, I told him the story of the traveling scribe in the old, the old days. And that every Jew has a Torah in their heart. 
and the Torah needs to be fixed sometimes. Sometimes the letters crack and they need to be fixed. I told him, I'm going to fix his letter in his soul. The Lubavitcher Rebbe got very serious and very, very sad. And the Chassid, the emissary, asked the Rebbe, why didn't I say something good? The Rebbe said, no. He said, you could have said something much better. He says, the, 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 the letters inside the soul of a Jew never crack. They're always complete. You should have told him, it's not like the letters of a Torah. You should have told him it's like the letters of a, of a, uh, of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were etched in stone. The Torah is written ink on parchment. But the Ten Commandments, the tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain, he etched them, God etched them in the, in the stone themselves. Those are the kind of letters that a Jew has. The Rebbe said, that, that, but those letters never disappear. Sometimes you go to a cemetery, you see that, that it looks a little dirty. Sometimes there's some algae or some, some uh, dust that gets in there. And you, every once in a while, you have to wash it out a little bit to make the letters uh, legible. So sometimes the, the letters become blurred. They become dirty and dusty. Your job is just to blow away the dust. So you should have said that you, you, your job is to go from city to city to blow away the dust from every Jew. Chas v'shalem, not to say that a Jewish heart can ever be damaged. The Jewish heart is always there. The letters of the, of the Torah are always there. It's etched in stone. And the reason why I tell you this story, because I want to tell you that that's what, in the cemetery, we were speaking last week about the Matzevis, about the memories that are etched in stone, about the good deeds that people do in their life, about their Jewishness, about their name that's etched in the stone, they're never forgotten. Our loved ones are never forgotten. <clears throat> Sometimes it speaks about a, a dead person, a mace, mishtakach min it's forgotten from the heart. Sometimes, uh, you know, you forget, you forget your loved ones. That's, that's the human nature. But it's, it's not gone. The memories are etched in our hearts. We remember them forever and ever. And that's what the stone is. The stone is to remind us that it's etched the memories, the, the mitzvahs, the good deeds of our loved ones are part and parcel of who we are. They'll never be forgotten. And that is why in the cemetery, we don't, there's two ways to make, even with stone, you could have the, 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 the letters can be protruding. You can create stone that the letters should protrude from the, from the stone. Or you can have them etched in the stone. So the Jewish tradition was always to have them etched in the stone. And not to have the letters protruding out, creating some kind of external thing. No. The letters are created from the stone itself. From the, from the inner parts of the stone, not something which is like on top of it, but it's deeper, it's deeper than deep. And that is the concept of the, of the, of the stone. So but the Jewish tradition has always been, when we have a loved one, we always make sure to place a stone, a monument, a matzeva, within the year. Now, there are different traditions. Some people put it if by, by the end of the year. Others put it after 30 days. Others even put it by the shiva. They already put up a stone. But regardless, it says you shouldn't, you shouldn't wait till after a year. The stone is very important. It's very significant. It symbolizes a lot of symbolism of all. As we mentioned last week, it goes back all the day, all the way back to Jacob and Rachel. He placed a mound of stones on the place of the... It's a marker. And last week, we spoke about the concept of tzion, about Zion means to mark off the place of our loved ones. It's forever marked off and will always, always be, be remembered. And here you have again, why do we make it out of stone? Why not make it out of wood? The monument, plant a tree, <laughs> the monument, right? Something else you could put on bush, 
You know, why, why the stone? Well, main, one main reason is because the stone is, is everlasting and the soul is also, just like the, the soul is indestructible. So we try to take something which is like the soul, which is indestructible as well. And so that's why we place a stone, which is also the hardest form of the, of the physical entity. It lasts as long as a tree lives long, but not as long as, as the, a stone does. And also because it's the concept of etching in, etching in the stone, the memories, so that's, that brings out this point that we just made. And it's also a, a reminder of the Ten Commandments, as we said before. The stone, uh, the, the, the monument that we place on our loved one is like we connect ourselves to the Torah. The Torah was made out of the, the Ten Commandments was made out of, out of it was hewn in, in the stone itself. So too, it's a reminder to us of the Ten Commandments about the purpose of life. So there are many symbolisms involved in, in, in why we have Hi. why we have a song. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Hello, hello. Okay. Yeah, Give me questions. one second. Okay. Thank you. You too. Okay. So if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, Hashem, you can hear me. We spoke last week a little bit about the language that goes onto the uh, monument. But first, I'm just going to tell you about the concept of the of the stone, the little stones that we place. You know, and actually, it's it's interesting that the stones, people used to do it, but it wasn't so popularized until the movie from Schindler's List. You know, in Schindler's List, at the end of the movie, they everybody goes up and places the stone. And I'm saying this, the custom was around for very long. But it was very, very much popularized in the Jewish community after that movie of Schindler's List. At the end, they all go up and they place a little stone as an honor, as a remembrance. Uh, so what's the concept of placing the stone? But I'm just mentioning uh, about Schindler's List. Kim will remember uh, the memories we have because we went to the, when we went on a trip for three or four years ago, we went on a trip to, uh, to Poland and then to Israel. There's a numerous members in our community and uh, we had the opportunity to go to visit uh, Schindler's factory. Uh, we went, it was, it was in, in, in uh, Krakow, I believe. Uh, that's where it was. And we went, we went there. Uh, it was uh, in the afternoon. We went with our bus and we went to visit the crowd. And you saw the famous gates in the front of his factory that, that was popularized as well in the movie. And we were standing there outside and we were thinking about speaking a lot about the Holocaust and about the righteous of the Gentiles and everything. And then one of the guys had to say Kaddish. So we, we, we went out of the bus and we stood there in front of Schindler's factory and we davened Mincha on the street, <laughs> right in front of his factory. I remember that one of the most memorable parts of the trip to, to praying the Mincha service in front of Schindler's factory. You know, it should be a, a good memory for all the people that were saved, all the people who were saved in there and, and, and Schindler himself was not was, was one of the righteous Gentiles who saved. From there we learned that 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 you know you don't be, need to be a great person to save lives. You just have to do it, and he he did it in a fantastic way. Um, so we in in the movie at the end of the movie when they all all the people they go they want to they want to uh, uh, to memorialize they all went walk over the end of the in, in, in the cemetery and they place a little stone. And that's the concept. So where does the concept of the stones come from? And I've done a lot of research on it, and it's not very, very clear where it comes from. Um, the only thing I can think of is that before the days that they used to have headstones, they used to have the little stones they used to place. Like it says, Jacob placed a mound of stones over the burial place of Rachel so she should be honored and people should know that somebody's buried there. So I guess when people used to come to the cemetery, they would, you know, the stones would be moved away by, by the wind or the animals or whatever, right? And every time you went to the cemetery, that's what you did. You, you fixed up the stones and you made it very nice and you placed a few more stones just to make it to memorialize. So I guess this concept of, of memorializing the person, remembering the person with a headstone, which they didn't have a headstone back then, was a little stones. Even if you made a, a 
permanent headstone became the style, they still always placed a few little stones on the, every time they went to the cemetery, uh, they would place a little stone on the, on the Matseva to show that you were there and to, to, to create that, uh, that uh, perpetual memory that you, by placing the stones. It's always at the end of the funeral, end of the unveiling always, I always ask everybody to come up, place a little stone on the, on the, on the Matseva. Uh, that's where that, that custom probably uh, originates from. Um, in, the, in the cemetery, uh, you know, the, the, there always was a, an emphasis of who you're buried next to. <laughs> uh, who you bury, who is the person that's buried next to you? It always was a great, a great thing to be buried near a tzaddik, near a righteous person. Um, you know, many people in New York, they want to be buried not far from where the Rebbe is buried. Or in Israel, they also want to be buried near righteous people. I guess the merit of the righteous people that's buried next, it says to be buried near a tzaddik, to be buried near a holy person is, is a great uh, a great thing. Uh, remember there used to be a fellow who used to come here to sell graves in Israel and he used to tell you it's right next to this tzaddik that you could be buried, get a good piece of real estate, of course it cost a few more dollars. If you're buried next to that righteous person, you could, uh, you know. But that's, that's the concept of being buried near a, a, a if, if you're buried near your spouse, so hopefully your spouse is, is a, you know, a lot of times people say they want to be buried next to their friends because they want to play the, the card games up there, whatever. So they think they're playing cards <laughs> in heaven or whatever. But play next to their friends, they're playing ma mahjong or whatever. <laughs> so so the, 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 the idea of being buried Next to a, a tzaddik, it always, was always a very, and I'll tell you a very, very fascinating story about that, about being buried uh, near a righteous person. So we went again on the trip to, uh, to Poland. We went to a very, very famous cemetery in Krakow. It's called the Cemetery of the Ramua. The Ramua Cemetery. The Ramua was um, the, in the code of Jewish law. The Code of Jewish Law is written by Joseph Caro, who is, who is, who is buried in, in, in Tzvat in Israel, but in, in Poland, in the city of Krakow, in the Kazimierz uh, section over there, the Jewish section, the Jewish ghetto, whatever it was called, there was a, there was a Jewish area there. Uh, Jews lived there for, 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 for you know, five, six hundred years ago. Right? And there was, it's a cemetery called the Ramur. The Ramur was Ramosha Isolish. Ramesha Isolish was one of the most, most fantastic Jewish rabbis that ever lived. And he, he wrote in the code of Jewish law called the Hagar. He wrote on, the, on the Joseph Carroll, and he always wrote how the Ashkenazic Jews conducted themselves vis-a-vis -vis certain things different than the Sephardics. Because uh, Rab Joseph Carroll, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, was Sephardi. So he wrote his, his footnotes on it, which became part of the code, to say how the Ashkenazic Jews, you know, so let, let's say that um, uh, Joseph Kairi will say that on Pesach you can eat rice. Uh, the Ramoa came and said, no, the, the this Ashkenazic tradition is not to eat rice on Pesach. So there are numerous places where they differ, but uh, the Ramoa was, was, uh, was a genius, uh, a great rabbi, one of the greatest rabbis who ever, uh, ever lived. So the cemetery is called the Ramoa Cemetery. And, and Krakow was a city with many, many great rabbis over, over the years. One of the most famous rabbis was also a rabbi called the Toysvus Yontif, of Yontif Lipman Heller. His name is Rabbi Heller. He was one of the greatest commentaries on the Mishnah. And he also lived in, in, in Krakow a uh, number of years after the Ramua. And he's also buried in the cemetery, the same cemetery of the Ramua. But a strange thing happens in that cemetery. People come to see where is Rabbi Heller buried? And you see, he's buried far back in the end of the cemetery. All the great rabbis are in the front of the cemetery. And this Rabbi Heller is buried in the back of the cemetery. So there's a tradition. Why was this rabbi buried at the far, far back of the cemetery? And I went to see it. We saw, we saw this burial place of this great rabbi. It was known as the Toysus Yontif. All the way in the back of the cemetery. So the tradition goes that at the time of this rabbi, the wealthiest Jew in all of Krakow was a fellow whose name was Yossel. 
but he was known as Yossel the Miser. He was the cheapest guy in all of uh, in all of Krakow. People came to him for tzedakah, he gave nothing. A few pennies he gave to tzedakah. And he was the wealthy, everybody knew him as the wealthiest guy in all of Krakow. And people like, they were so upset with him. He was like such a, such a disappointment to the community because he never gave charity. And then there came the day and he passed away, this Yossel the Miser. He was known as Yossel the Miser. And he passed away. And the Chavre Kaddisha, whom he never supported, the burial society, he decided this guy, he never helped anybody in the whole city. So they, they decided they're going to bury him in the back of the cemetery, all the way at the end of the cemetery. Because a guy that never helped a single Jew and he had so much money, never helped a single, all the orphans, all the widows in the city, this was one of the main, main, major metropolises of Jewish life at that time in Poland. Krakow. Everybody knew the city of Krakow. So the Chavre Kaddish said they'll, they'll get him. <laughs> they, they couldn't get him while he was alive, but they'll bury him in the back of the cemetery. They, they're in, over here, they're in charge. So they gave, him, they gave him the worst spot in the whole cemetery. And uh, the rabbi was informed of it. He said, okay, I guess, you know, whatever, you know. He never really did so much. You can't bury him in the front with the, all the great dignitaries. So they put him in the back. And a few weeks went by, and suddenly there was a big tumult, a big noise, a big, everybody was going crazy in Krakow. What happened was, the grocer, grocer who used to give all the years credit and used to give for free food to the poor people, stop giving food to the poor people. The butcher stopped giving meat. He used to give to all the poor people all the years he was giving, but he suddenly stopped giving meat to all the poor people. The baker, chalice and Shabbos, always he had a whole shelf of chalice for all the poor people in the city. Stopped giving. So the rabbi came to find out, why is everybody stopping? All the poor people are relying on it. So quietly, all these, the butcher, the baker, and the grocery man, they said, we can't give anymore. We used to give all the years, but we were supported by an anonymous donor. The rabbi said, who was the anonymous donor? You have to tell me, I'm the rabbi. I need to, to fix the situation. He said, the anonymous donor just passed away. His name was Yossel the Miser. Rabbi, look, you mean all these years, all these people were receiving tzedakah, they were receiving all these meat and food and everything. The whole city was being supported by this one guy. He said, yeah, so you promised us that you can give as much as you want as long as you don't let the people know the source. He believed in giving charity under the radar, quietly. He didn't want to get any honors for it. So the rabbi felt so bad. He wasn't Yossel the miser. He was Yossel the tzaddik. He was Yossel the, the, the generous person of the whole city. So the rabbi said, you know what? This is the biggest tzaddik, the greatest righteous person of the whole city who gave charity all these years. People used to spit at him. And he, but he did it in a way that nobody should know about it. Never got any COVID, never got any honor. The rabbi says, when I die, he put in his, in his will, he says, I want you to bury me next to Yossel the Miser. That's where I want to be buried, right beside him. Because you're supposed to be buried near a righteous person. And this is by far the most righteous man in this city. And so, a young of Lippmann Heller, you go find his, his burial place. You go to the back of the cemetery. You see a beautiful monument for him. And right beside it, you see like a very, very simple monument. It says Yosef, whatever. You can see it. You can look it up online. There's pictures of it, actually. You can actually see Rabbi Yossel the Miser's monument right next to the rabbi, Rabbi Yontav Lippmann Heller. Yeah. But I see Helga's getting some of the sunshine, too, which I had before. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. But I want to tell you like this. That the story doesn't end there. The story has a continuation in Toronto. 
this story that happened 500 years ago, about 400 years ago in, in Krakow, continued, continues now in Toronto. How, you ask how? How does the story continue? I'll tell you the story. So I study every day for many, many years already for a rabbi who's Kanaina Hur, he's turning already 90 years old, Rabbi Shafat. I studied with him already for many, many years. He's one of the greatest rabbis in the city. And I have the honor of studying with him. So he shared with me the following story. He said, when he first came to Toronto in the 1950s, okay, he was actually, he was here before, he was in the 1940s also, he grew up in Toronto. But the Rebbe sent him to be a shaliach here, to be a, a rabbi here in the city of Toronto. So he came, got married in the late 50s, and he moved here to Toronto. And he came here. And at that time, you know, he used to, he used to service Toronto, and he also used to service uh, Niagara Falls and Buffalo, and go there for the different things. So, so he was invited to speak for the Jewish community over there in Buffalo. And he went to Buffalo to speak. And the, the, the topic that they asked him to speak about in, this, in, this, in the community center in Buffalo was to speak about the subject of charity of tzedakah. So he thought, you know, tell the story, tell the story, because this story really underscores the importance of giving tzedakah, you know, under the radar to give tzedakah quietly and not to, not to make a big, you know, talk of yourself, but to do it in, in, in matem basesha, it's called giving it, uh, in a concealed manner, giving it uh, discreetly. So he tells the story over there, and 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 it was a very very eclectic crowd that came to this. They heard a rabbi was speaking, so they came from all over. And at the end, uh, there was a guy that came over to him, and he introduced himself as a priest. Came to the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, you told that story of. Yossel the miser and, and the Rabbi Heller there, the whole story it says, can you tell me that story again? I, I really want to hear the details. Rabbi, Rabbi told it to him again. He said, then he says, a few more, I want to hear a few more details. The Rabbi says, you know what? I'm going to the hotel now. I, I can't, I don't have time to sit. Come to the hotel room and I'll, I'll. So he went to the hotel room. He struck a conversation with the Rabbi. And again, he he said, tell me the story again, Rabbi. I want to hear the story again. I love this story. Give me all the details. This priest, right? And Rashacha tells him the story. He says, why are you so interested in hearing the story three times? He says, you won't believe it. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a priest, but I'm a, he's a minister. He was a minister. He says, my background actually is Jewish. My father wasn't Jewish, but my mother was Jewish. So the rabbi says, well, that means, according to Judaism, that means you're Jewish. Yeah, he says, but there's more to the story. One day before my mother died, my mother told me that I come from a rich Jewish heritage. And you should know that you are a descendant of someone that's known in the Jewish community as Yossel the miser, the holy miser. So when I heard this story, it brought a spark to me. My mother told me that I come from the... And Rabbi Shachat said, he says, you think the story ends there, the rabbi says? He says, I am a descendant, he says, of Rabbi Heller. I'm a direct descendant of, of the two guys who are buried near each other. He says, I'm a descendant, direct descendant of Rabbi Yomtev Litvin Heller, the Toysvist Yomtev, who's buried beside Yossel the he also the holy miser. Hashem brings it all together. And the rabbi, you know, this guy was like so moved by this whole story. Anyways, but the story doesn't end there. <laughs> the story goes on and on. A right. few years later, the rabbi is by the Kotel in Jerusalem. He's ending his prayers there, Rabbi Shachet. He's ending his prayers in, 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 in Jerusalem. And he's walking away from the wall, and somebody taps him on the shoulder. He says, who are you? There's a guy with a beard. With a kippah. He says, he says, you don't recognize me, Rabbi? 
He says, after that story, I was so inspired by the whole thing that I moved to Israel and I went to yeshiva in Jerusalem and now I've become a rabbi myself. <laughs> a whole story unfolds. This is the grandson of the holy miser, the priest, the minister. He became a rabbi himself. All the, you know, the, work, the workings of the grandparents one beside each other. And I tell you this story because, like, we're talking about being buried near each other. Everything is bashert. Where you are, who you are, who you're near, what's happening. And also the concept that I wanted to tell you about being buried next to a righteous person. We, we never know who is really the righteous person also. Right? But a, it's a big mitzvah to be buried in a holy place and to be buried near a righteous person. So, uh, our story about the dead and about the monuments and about the shiva and about the shloish and about the year and about it's coming more or less to an end <laughs> that mitzvah but uh, this class is called kabbalah of the mitzvahs so mitzvah Shem, next week please god will start with a, a new mitzvah maybe a happier mitzvah <laughs> we've been talking about death i think we've been talking about it for about a half a year already so we will we'll continue next week, um, If anybody has any questions about this week's class, you're welcome to ask me. I told you a lot of nice stories today. Um, anyone have any uh, questions? Uh, Rabbi, they were good stories. We appreciate them. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome very much. Right, right. So Rabbi Shachet actually is, is celebrating his 90th birthday this, wow. this Shabbat. This Shabbat. <laughs> How do you like that? That's the end of that story. <laughs> Hopefully the story continues for many years to come. Isn't the hate? But that's the story. Okay, Thank guys. You. I, have one, I have one question. Aline, you have a question? I yeah, I just wanted to know. Um, my parents, my parents are uh, buried in Montreal. And my sister and her family. Well, hold on, hold on, one, one, one second. Hold on, hold on one second. I need to, I need to do something. Here. Um, give me a second. Okay, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, yeah, so my parents, uh, the Shalom, are buried in Montreal, and my right. sister and her family, too. Right. Anyways, I just wanted to know, did I do anything wrong? Because I don't go there well with COVID. I, before right before COVID, I did take pictures of the Mitzavis. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong. To see the the monument, to see the to, to remember just them. Just wanted I wanted to have yeah, it always yeah, with yeah. It's very good, and in fact, in, in some cemeteries now, uh, they they are posting online all the all the pictures of matzevas. There are there are some uh, sites where you can go and see every single matzeva. There's a project, really? in fact, to record every single stone in in, in the in the whole world. Uh, many of the very popular cemeteries are completely uh, uh, recorded. And they have pictures of every single stone and exactly where everybody is. So that anyone can find out where any, any uh, Jewish person is around the world. So it's, it's, it's very, it, it, for rabbis especially, it's, it's very important to, uh, to determine Jewishness, to find out names, to find out someone's a coin or a levy. So the information is, is a major resource. So there's nothing oh, wrong with taking Thank taking you. I always thought maybe I wasn't that. supposed to, or it's not nice, or not supposed. Thank you. Now no, I feel, no, no. now I'm proud of it no, in no. here. No. Okay, see, thank you. So you did the right thing. Okay. <laughs> good. Uh, okay, well, I want to have a good Shabbos, a good week. Good Shabbos. Thank you. Tomorrow night we have the Shabbos, Shabbos program. Anyone would like to come join us? Okay.